Good morning. morning. I want to welcome you this morning as we gather around God's Word. We want to welcome those that are watching online as well, too, and pray that you're blessed through our ministry today. Today we're again looking at the attitude adjustment that God brings to us, and today we're going to hear about marriage, and uh, we'll hear more about that in our sermon. But also we want to recognize, too, that today is our Lutheran Women's Missionary League, and so throughout some of our service, uh, you'll see some of the parts that are there. The Lutheran Women's Missionary League started as a league of women that wanted to help in the post-war years of World War II to help those that were in war-torn Europe. And so that ministry continues today, uh, more than 75 years, and it's still an active role within our church body. Um, And they combine the efforts of many of the women and also organizations that help to drive ministry in that. And so you'll see in the bulletin some of that information as well, too, that points that out. And so... Let us at this time rise and greet those around us with a hand of fellowship and welcome. Blessed are all who fear the Lord. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. May the Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem. May you live to see your children's children. And peace be on the people of God. We sing our opening hymn. of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise. And receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, 
let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking His grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in His mercy, has given His Son to die for you, and for His sake, forgives you all your sins as a called and ordained servant of Christ. And by His authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we will hear our scripture lessons found in our bulletin. This Old Testament reading gives some insights into God's intention for humanity in the man-woman relationship. We see that he designs us to be social creatures with relationship needs. We see that men and women are the same essential creature of God, created originally in his image, and we see that as husband and wife, we are to provide for each other the full, lasting relationship that can be found nowhere else. Genesis chapter 2. Then the Lord said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had performed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave be names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a, hel a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and the wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is the word of the Lord. Be we move to a semi-continuous reading of the letter of Hebrews. It will provide the epistle lesson for seven Sundays. Today's lesson emphasizes that when God's Son came to be our Savior, he did not just temporarily pretend to be a man. He fully became our brother in the human family, died in atonement for our sins, and thus entered his glory. Now through him we relate to God as his beloved children, Hebrews 2, 1 through 18. Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will, the founder of salvation. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to, subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he for whom by, and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, 
I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those for who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for our gospel action. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory Glory. To you, o Lord. For us who live in a society that, with casual attitudes toward marriage and divorce, Jesus has some strong guidance. He wants us to see that such the attitudes and their consequences adulterate God's intentions for a man and a woman in marriage. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the fourth chapter. And he left there and went to the region of Judah and beyond the Jordan. And crowds gathered to him again. And again, as he was his custom, he taught them. And the Pharisees came and in order to test him, asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, lest no man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated for our sermon hymn. O Father, all creating.
Let us begin with prayer, we pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you to hear your word, and we pray, Lord, that in the attitude of our lives, we would find uh, your will at work. Be with us, Lord, and be with the marriages of our congregation and our families, that you would strengthen them. In your name we pray, amen. We continue again our sermon series, again on adjusting attitudes. And as we remember, we are looking at those conversations that Jesus has with people in the Gospel of Mark chapter 8 and 9. We see that Jesus responds to them, and he also confronts them and helps to adjust their attitude to align with that of God's will. It's easy if you're not affected by what Jesus says. But today, in our, his conversation with the Pharisees, he addresses a topic that's relevant to us of marriage and the dissolvement divorce and what it has to do with us as the people of God. It was an issue in their day, and it is also an issue in our day as well, too. And Jesus is addressing the attitude we have toward marriage. Jesus draws our attitude not from the culture that we live in and not even from the religious arguments that we have, but he draws it from his Father's will. When God gave us the gift of marriage in the garden, I want to recognize something as I have been a preacher for almost 25 years, and I recognize that sometimes when people listen to sermons, sometimes they're not really listening. They're really hearing what they want to hear. And I want to be clear about that because as we hear the topic today, I want to say to you that this sermon is not about divorce. It may be easy to hear that in a sermon, but Jesus is really addressing the commitment that God has intended in marriage for us and that we are called to adjust our attitude as a culture, as a society, and even among ourselves. God takes the commitment of marriage seriously and he wants us to take it seriously as well. I would, op I, I would invite you to open up your hymnals to page 275. Page 275 is the marriage ceremony. Much of the m marriage ceremony or the wedding service is probably in our minds. But at the beginning of wedding services, after the invocation, we usually will say these words. Dearly beloved, we're gathered here in the sight of God and before his church to witness the union of this man and this woman in a holy matrimony. This is an honorable estate instituted and blessed by God in paradise before humanity's fall into sin. That is correct. Those words to consider follow the last line. By God given in paradise before humanity's fall into sin. That really was the idea that God the Father established in the perfection of the, his garden when all things were pure and all things were innocent and we had the foreknowledge to be with God. Adam and Eve walked in the cool of the day. God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And the rib the Lord took from Adam's side and formed woman. And man, Adam, responded by saying, this at last is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Those words are very familiar to us. But more insightful, probably, and joyful is a description that Matthew Henry, the pastor, gives in his commentary on these, this text. And he says something enlightening. He says, Women was made of a rib out of the side of Adam, not made out of the head to rule over him, nor out of the feet to trample upon him, but out of his side to be equal with him and under his arms to protect and near to his heart to be loved. 
That's a beautiful quote. And after all, Adam's declaration of where Eve came from. The scripture gives us the formula of what marriage is. A man shall leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were naked and were not ashamed. It's an interesting thing that the ESV uses that word, hold fast. Many of you may recall the King James wording that says he will cleave to his wife. The translation of that word is really a partnership, a union of brought together. And it's interesting to note that when we ask the vows of a husband and wife, a bride and a groom, we ask those words to be wedded, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, richer for poorer, sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. These words are repeated in weddings, and you probably have had these words repeated in your wedding as well, too. In the perfection of the garden, God gave the institute of marriage. So marriage isn't a human arrangement. It is God who joins husband and wives together, and the original wording, again, is to be yoked, like a team put together. So God wants marriage so long as they both shall live or till death do us part. And in this arrangement, marriage is not a temporary convenience, but a lifelong commitment to have a helper in one's life. That was before the fall. After the fall, everything fell apart. In our gospel text, we hear that the Pharisees come to test Jesus, and they ask him, Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? You must understand that the discussion that the Pharisees are having probably takes place in the school of the Pharisees. Rabbinical writing describes to us that there were two views of the laws of Moses. There was the liberal view that went by the spirit of the law, and then there was the more conservative legal view that went by the written law. And so Pharisees among themselves debated, and they on that day hoped to catch Jesus in what he would say. It isn't that they're interested in his response. Instead, they're interested in testing him and catching him. Whatever his answer is, they probably have a way to catch him. But Jesus then answers, what did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce, to send her away. Moses permitted divorce, provided the husband gives his wife a certificate of divorce. All of this is drawn from Deuteronomy chapter 24. And it's interesting because it leaves the matter of divorce entirely to the discretion of the husband. If the husband found something wrong with the wife in his own view, he could give her a pink slip. But it doesn't outline the grounds for divorce, and it doesn't even endorse it. It simply places restrictions on a husband. If for some reason he finds something wrong with his wife and he casts her away, he gives her a legal written certificate of divorce, protecting her in a way from abandonment. You see, she was free then to marry again. And that's actually what the text kind of says. This certificate of divorce allowed her to move on with her life, to remarry, and it prevented the first husband from changing his mind and kind of reclaiming her. It deterred anything that might be seen as a, a give-me-back kind of scandal. The law was therefore intended to keep social upheaval and association with divorce to a minimum. But Jesus then says, because of the hardness of the heart, wrote you this command. You see, the Pharisees went back to Moses, and they divided kind of an understanding from Moses' writing. But Jesus went back to Genesis. Jesus contends that Moses' command was really a compromise in situation designed to reduce the fallout of man's hardness of heart. But Jesus' reasoning became clear. The state of Moses' legislation of allowing a man to write a ticket of divorce when he found something wrong with her 
was rooted in man's hardness of heart. A willful defiance against God's will cannot reflect God's will. Moses may have given the law to regulate divorce, but divorce is not God's will for marriage. And therefore, we should not construe a stipulation from Deuteronomy 24 that God allows us to condone and disregard our wives. And so, sending them away. You see, divorce is seen as a sin in God's eyes because it originates in man's hardness of hearts. The Pharisees needed to discover that God commanded, not what Moses said. Moses may have allowed men to give their wife the pink slip, but Jesus addresses from them the perspective of God's promise. And it's an interesting thing when we read the Bible, that we read after the fall. Before the fall, marriage is great. But after Adam and Eve choose to disobey God, the institution itself falls apart. We see this in Adam and Eve's relationship, that they become in conflict with each other. The man having dominance over his wife and his wife having desire for her husband has led us toward difficulty. And not just that, we see this in the fruits of their family. From the patriarchs, from Jacob and Esau's parents who had one love over another love for a child, to the judges, to even the kings, David and Solomon, and all of their multitude of wives. You see, even our human reason causes us to wonder the commitment that requires such a responsibility and effort. But then it's the hardness of hearts. From the heart comes out all types of sin. Selfishness, ambition, lust, rage, all of these things and more. More come from the heart. And Jesus identifies that the problem in the institution of marriage is not God's intent, but it's man's heart. So, from the lives of Adam and Eve to today, when couples say, I do, the fruits of sin are present in marriage. The easiest thing to do, or even our earthly marriages, have difficulties. And it's easy for us to think that divorce is an easy way out. But just consider this. Although the law dissolves a marriage, the emotions are still, or the emotions that we've invested are still there. Children are still present. Relationships and emotions with in-laws and extended family, all are there. The law of the land may say dissolve the marriage, but can we really? You see, Jesus' opponents, the Pharisees, must have misunderstood and construed Scripture and God's will for marriage. God created male and female and joined them together in a relationship to be helpers. Since God is the one who joins together, he is the Lord of the union. Who are the males then to make Lord of the marriage and just oust their unwanted wife? as they may discard a piece of used goods. You see, the marvel of it is that God did not abandon us at a time of difficulty. Sin came into the world and God was strictly dealing with sin in Jesus Christ. The forgiveness that God bestowed and what Christ had accomplished covered a multitude of sins. To understand more about the saving grace that Christ bestows on the church, One of the greatest texts to look at is that of Ephesians chapter 5. We've heard probably Ephesians chapter 5 many times. They're used in wedding texts, right? A husband, well, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Ephesians 5 as a wedding text is great. But really Paul uses the illustration of husband and wife to describe what Christ does for the church. Just listen. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might present the church to himself as a splendor without spoil or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish, just as Christ does the church. Again, going back to the text, 
Wives, submit to yourselves out of love of Christ. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water through the word, so that he might present her. In the same way, husbands and wives should love their wives as their own bodies, and he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Ephesians 5 does make a very good wedding text, but it also does a very good job of describing for us exactly what Christ did for the church. If we apply that then to the institute of marriage, we recognize that when sinners say I do, the need of God's forgiveness must be thoroughly involved in the wedding and in the marriage. Therefore, a man shall leave his father, be united to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The marvel of what God instills in the institution of marriage is to provide us a helper in caring for us. I want to say this for those that have been affected by divorce and also those that are divorced. It's important for us to recognize that Jesus and his statements and his commitments toward marriage in other places speak about this. The interesting thing is that the Gospel of Mark doesn't record the full wording of Jesus, but Jesus says that marriage is our divorce, our divorce is allowed through adultery and also abandonment in another place of Scripture. Whether we take that definition just small or or expand it more to mean Adultery in the sense of not providing for our spouse. One can apply it in that way. But there is a need for us also to receive forgiveness and to recognize that Christ's forgiveness does cover the sins that we have committed, but also the sins that have been committed to us. We recognize that although divorce comes to people, sometimes people choose not to be part of it and they are forced upon by their spouse, or by the actions of their spouse. Christ's forgiveness is clear, and his forgiveness is for all. As we look at the commitment that Jesus states for us, and he states for those in the institution of marriage, it's important for us to recognize that marriage in God's eyes is a loving institution where two people grow in mutual love toward one another. There is a lot of Forgiveness that can come when a relationship of marriage is rocky and two people learn again to start over. Counseling, Christian counseling is part of that. It's also an encouragement to recognize that when we marry another person, we really take on the task of loving them as Christ loved the church. And we see that Christ was sacrificial. As head of the church, he comes to serve the church. Husbands, you must serve your wives. And wives, you must love your husbands. In doing so, you bring honor to your family and you also bring honor to God's institution. In a society where marriage and other inventive, creative relationships are described in the same way of marriage, we as Christians know clearly that God instituted this marriage for our good. And whatever society has said or done or decides to do, The Christian understanding of marriage can influence the culture and bring about a renewal of the meaning of marriage. May Christ work in us and through our church and in our lives to fulfill our commitment to be followers of Christ. Amen. Let us rise. We confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation 
came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In our prayers today, we want to pray for those that are um, in need of prayers and healing. We also want to pray for those that have lost loved ones this week. Uh, we want to pray especially for um, uh, the Kalmbach family, and we also want to pray for the Stokes family. Um, J. John T. Stokes was a member of St. Paul's, but he used to worship with us from time to time. And so uh, he had passed away, um, and we want to pray for his family at this time. Let us pray. O oh God of heaven, we come before you in thanksgiving. We thank you, Lord, that in the midst of a world that as a time seems to have no bottom and is in conflict with itself, you have given us a, a pronouncement of your will in your word. Lord, above all, we pray that our understanding and our commitment to our marriages and the marriages around us would be one of strengthening and helping and also encouraging even during difficult times. Lord, we pray for those who walk a path of difficulty in their own lives. And we ask, Lord, that you'd give them strength, help them to see in you a renewal of their calling to be husbands and wives. We pray for others, Lord, who miss their spouses and ask, Lord, you give them comfort. You also, Lord, have promised us to provide all that we need in this life, to give us our daily bread. Be with those, Lord, who find it difficult during these times of economic difficulty. Lord, we also pray for Florida that will soon experience a hurricane and places through the south that have been affected greatly by the last hurricane. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would help to restore life there. Keep safe those that are affected by danger and watch over those that come to their aid. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for an end of war around the world. We pray for places of peace in Ukraine and the Middle East and Israel. To peace in our families, Lord, where there is conflict, give us a renewal of being peacemakers. We pray, Lord, for those that are affected. We pray for the Stoke family, and we pray also, Lord, for the Kalmbach family, and ask that you comfort them in the knowledge that because you live, they will live also with those that have passed. We pray especially, O Lord, for Donna as she is recovering from surgery. And we thank you, Lord, for her recovery and ask that you continue to be with her as she works through physical therapy. We pray for Arthur, who undergoes tests and is waiting for results. We pray for Reggie, Bonnie, Vivian, Debbie, Alice. We pray for Francis and Carlos, AP, Evelyn, Doris, Alton, Georgia, Doris, Ruth, Priscilla, Gail, Jeanette, Evelyn, Eugene, and Mary. We also pray, Lord, for friends and family. For Kathy, Susan, Mike, Wes, Ruth, Sandy, Haley, Elizabeth, Randy, Greg, Barbara, Julie, Joyce, Sue, Shelley, Emery, Vernon, and Dorothy. And for those men and their families who are deployed in service, to our country, for my godson, Christopher, for Steve Smith, for the Nimsh family and Pastor Nimsh's deployment to Korea, for Anthony Toops and James Butler and family. We pray all of these things, Lord. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. As I had said before, um, the Lutheran Women's Missionary League started by collecting small change after the post-war years of World War II, and they continue in that ministry today. Um, one of the things that they use is mite box. They invite people to use small amounts of change to be collected, and then they put all of that together. And the amazement of that is that they uh, provide a lot of resources for for ministries um, in our church and also projects as well, too. So you'll find information of that in your bulletin. follow our order of communion found in our bulletin. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right and salutary, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestowed on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sins, giving him into death that we might not die eternally because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. And all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you this do in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is a new testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do also in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
given for these gifts that God has given. Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you, his face upon you, and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is uh, sung to the tune of Onward Christian Soldiers. It's the LWL song.
that watched online. Um, if there are any thoughts about the sermon or even the uh, service today that you have come to your heart or you anything you want to talk about, you can talk to me following our service at another time. Uh, two things. One, if you'd like to download the app for the Lutheran Bible, Study Bible, that can be on your phone. Uh, there's an advertisement there for that. I believe the cost is $10 a year. Um, and then also, too, um, we're starting the book, uh, The Study of the Prophets. If you'd like to be part of our study and join us for that, we're looking at the minor prophets from the standpoint of how are they relevant today. And I think they are in many ways. So we invite you to come to begin that study with us between our services. So again, thank you all for being here.